Good evening. Welcome to the council meeting of October 15, 2024. Anyone in the audience needs amplifying headphones, please raise your hand and we'll deliver those. Uh, not seeing any, let's rise for the pledge, please. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Do a roll call, please. Yes, I will. Council Member Blush. Here. Council Member Stearns. Here. Council Member Gilmore. Here. Mayor Onisco. Here. Deputy Mayor Sherman. Here. Council Member Sapp. Here. And Council Member Gutierrez. Here. Thank you, Daniel. Does the council have any late changes to the agenda? City Manager? Not the time, Mr. All right. Any board reports to share? All right. Has everyone read the consent agenda? Is there a motion? We can approve the consent agenda. As a oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we need to read. I know. Okay. Because <laughs> we changed that. Yeah. Maybe have a read of the consent agenda, please. Yes. We have vouchers numbered 111 through 6, 636 through 111 677, and EFT payment numbers 686 through 705 in the total amount of $166,161.77. Payroll warrants numbered 3999 and 13348 through 13446 and 111-620 through 111-632 in the amount of $366,704.86. Vouchers numbered 111-701 through 111-734 and EFT payment numbers 706 through 728 in the total amount of $184,861.20. Payroll warrants numbered 4000 through 4003 and 13447 through 13549 and 111678 through 111696 in the amount of $522,959.60 and the minutes from the study session of September 10th, 2024. Thank you, Daniel. Now is there a motion to move to approve the consent agenda as read? Second. All right, we have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda as read. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. The council invites the public to make comments on matters of city business. Comments shall be made to the entire council, not the individual council members. Please refrain from any personal or disrespectful remarks that create disruption of the meeting. If unreasonable disruptive conduct continues, you'll be asked to leave the meeting. Danielle, anyone signed up for general public comment? Yes, we do. Our first speaker is Monty Ritter. Appreciate this. Hello, my name is Monty River. I uh, am a resident of Shelton, just outside of the city limits in the uh, Shelton River Growth Area. And uh, what I've been doing is back in 2005, because I receive uh, city services, I I get city water. I was allowed to sit on the city uh, parks uh, citizens advisory committee. And uh, back in 2005, we put together your city comprehensive plan for the parks department. And with, uh, with our city parks manager, Mark Ziegler, and in our uh, parks plan, the, uh, we put out a nice survey we requested uh, uh, comments back from the people in the city at, at Shelton. And, and the most requested trail was a trail between the high school, the Mason County High School, and the, and, and the Mason County Recreational Area. Um, we, we, we had this big request from the people in, in Shelton um, to get this, the kids off of the side of Johnsbury Road on, on their pathway. Between the high school and the uh, and the Mason County Recreational Area, we weren't able to do that. I, I joined the I sat on the uh, Mason County Park Department uh, Park Board in 2009, and our most requested trail was a trail between City of Shelton and Belfair, and we tried really hard. 
Um, and basically, we really started from the Belfair side, heading south towards Allen, and that didn't really work out. And that was kind of difficult, but this is around 2019, or 2016. We weren't able to get this completed, but we, we, we really tried, and it was a big part of, uh, of what the people in Mason County and in Shelton wanted. Um, unfortunately, the Mason County Park Department dropped the, 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 the from its comp plan. They, we dropped the component of going from Shelton to Belfair because we weren't successful. And because we don't have that component in our Mason County Comprehensive Parks Plan, we do not have access to a lot of funding that's out there that we could use to, to complete a portion of a trail from Shelton to Belfair, which would be Shelton to the Mason County Recreational Area. Just, we need the language on the Mason County comp plan so that we could have access to this funding so we could use it to, to complete a trail from Shelton to the Mason County Recreational Thank, thank you, Monty. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead and email us uh, the rest if you'd like. I appreciate that, yeah. if I may. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Yeah. We have Ted Killinan. I'm sorry if I said that wrong. My name is Ted and I live up on Capitol Hill as well. Is it possible to allow my time to be given to the party? No, we don't do that, sorry. Pardon? Well, sorry. I wish that was possible. Yeah. I'd like to be able to do this. Yeah. And sorry. comprehensive, and finish off our conversation. Yeah. Thank sorry. you, though, for your time. I appreciate that. You guys have been wonderful. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next, we have Susan Kirchhoff. Good evening, council members. I'm Susan Kirchhoff, executive director of the Youth Connection, providing services to young people 12 to 24. Um, every day I come across challenges within our demographic addressing the growing need for affordable housing, access to treatment centers, and mental health support. As a person who has experienced ho homelessness on three different occasions, as well as housing instability as an adult, I recognize the absolute necessity to address this growing issue within our community. Just this week, we had three individuals we had to call 911 on who were ODing in our center. Just today, Commerce released the Washington State Five-Year Homeless Housing Strategic Plan, which shares many great focuses, which include increasing the number of permanent housing units across the state, ensuring statewide homeless crisis system is, in, is high performing, has accountability, and is transparent. Expanding connections and coordination between the systems to include behavioral health organizations, jails, prisons, and of course, youth services. Involving individuals with lived experience in the process and learning how best to work with and improve the situation within our unhoused population. They know what works and we should listen to them. As we look at the situation in our community, I'm actually kind of excited about the opportunities um, that we have to work with and improve our system. Just last week, I was asked and agreed to consult with Community Lifeline my main goal is to provide guidance and opportunities to improve and change the environment, both inside and outside of their building. We have already agreed to some changes which will be put in place by November 1st. I'm excited at the opportunity to support them, help them, because they are a much needed organization in our community. Where else are we to put our unhoused individuals? I have heard rumbling about a town meeting, and I would appreciate the opportunity to have a constructive and beneficial conversation to find a solution which provides dignity and respect for all the individuals involved. I just want to remind everyone here, the majority of our unhoused individuals did not wake up one morning and decide, today, I'm going to choose to be homeless. It does not work that way. 
just like in my own situation, each time I was homeless, it was out of my control and it was devastating. I just want to encourage us to think about that as we moving forward and we're dealing with our unhoused population. And I want to, on a brief moment, say I'm really uh, in appreciative of this trail opportunity. So I'm going to be involved in that too. Thanks. Thank you, Susan. Up next, we have Tamara Ingwaldson. Good evening, Mayor, David and Mayor, and all the council members. Thank you for this opportunity to share some information with you. And um, keep up the energy. She's a great partner. Um, my name is Tamara Ingwaldson. I live in Lake Limerick, but I work for New Horizon Communities, and we provide permanent supportive housing, and part of that program is the Shelton Veterans Village. And I wanted to come here today to invite you to our ribbon cutting. On October 30th, we will be having a ribbon cutting for our solar panels that have been installed. All three villages will now have solar panels and solar power. Um, we're inviting you to this event on the 30th from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. We'll have some light refreshments. And one of the cool factoids is the installation of the solar panels at this one particular village will save more than $165,000 over 30 years. And that savings from the solar energy will help be able to be redirected into programs and services and the intern opportunities that we provide for people working on their masters in behavioral health. So that way we're helping to train up behavioral health providers who are stronger and have a more depth and breadth to their skill sets when they come out into the community to be your therapist. But at the same time, it allows us the opportunity to meet our residents where they are and bring services to them that can be consistent, create that level of trust, that opportunity for people to really be in relationship as they work on their programs and themselves. So again, wanted to invite you to the ribbon cutting on October 30th. And thank you again for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, tomorrow. Up next, we have Dean Jewett. Good morning, got a lot to cover, three minutes to do it. Uh, I want to chat about your guys' new revised, uh, they have to sign before you can speak. Uh, you can't address an individual person. Uh, I want to make sure and bring to your, your uh, attention three lawsuits uh, that the citizens were able to sue the city for just that reason. The mayor trying to throw people out. The city of East Point had settled a lawsuit with four individuals that they had to pay $17,910 and basically list uh, August 6th as a uh, First Amendment rights day. Uh, another one in Surprise, Arizona, where the mayor had a woman thrown out and had her arrested for trespassing. Lawsuit there. Who won? The citizen. Uh, Cleveland, Ohio. Ohio. The mayor warns he would cut the mic for insults, uh, the character of an official. Uh, basically, you, you're talking about your First Amendment and your 14th Amendment. I'll send these to you, Mark, so you can take a look at them. Uh, so if I address you personally, I'm going to do it. If you want to throw me out, I guess we're heading down a lawsuit. Uh, affordable housing that you guys talked about at your study session. It's a very unprofessional behavior. Uh, there was an individual, i.e. the mayor, that said that maybe everybody should go shop in Oregon instead. Okay. Uh, very unprofessional. There was another individual that said, let's tax them to the max. I'll, I'll, I'll speed ahead. Uh, and another individual that supported it. Uh, there was individuals that supported not taking it to a vote of the people and just doing it as a uh, as a as a council. So we're talking about you know raising taxes to the tune of six hundred and seventeen thousand under one plan, one hundred sixty seven on another plan, uh, three hundred and ten on another plan. Since when does the city get into the business of running a mitigation site or doing construction on a site? I know it's, it's, it's irresponsible in my opinion. Uh, we're talking about, uh, we, can't even, we can't even run the ordinances that we already have on the books. We have RVs and campers that have been cruising through town for a year. Where do they defecate? Where do they urinate? Okay, so you call them in, what do they do? They move around the block. If you look at the ordinance, it doesn't matter where they move. It doesn't start the clock over again. And if they pop their hood up, it doesn't matter. They're not broke down. Uh, the city, basically, you know, there's the, uh, uh, the case that just went to the Supreme Court. Uh, Mark Ziegler's quoted several times, uh, it's not necessary to fix this through the court system. Uh, well, what is it? 
if we keep doing what we've always done, we're going to keep getting what we've always got. What we've got don't work. So why can't we take a change and look at something else and see what that does? And why, why do we have to worry about uh, you know, one set of the population, but we don't have to worry about our businesses? Who pays the taxes? Who pays your guys' the salaries? Who, has the, who, who gives you the money to have the city run? Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Monty. Oh. We have one more speaker on Zoom, Dave Redman. Hi, Dave. His, he's on mute. Dave, you're on mute. You might be on our side, too. Oh, is it gone? There we go. There we go. Okay. Good evening, everybody. I'm sorry. I had technical problems. Uh, my name is Dave Redman. I'm a retired army officer and I'm program supervisor at Shelton Veterans Village. Uh, I do I have good news and bad news. Uh, my comments tonight will take far less than three minutes. Uh, the bad news is there's going to be a little bit of a number stump. And I apologize for that, but thank you in, in advance for bearing with me. Uh, recently, the Addictions, Drug and Alcohol Institute conducted an anonymous survey with our residents and many others in supported living facilities across the state of Washington as well. I was provided a courtesy copy of how the results stacked up against the rest of the state. And I'd like to take a moment just to share those results with you and let you know how special the, the village is and what amazing job the case managers there are doing with our veterans. Uh, zero Shelton Veterans Village participants reported legal drug use in the past while they've been living there, compared with 43% of participants statewide. Zero Shel Shelton Veterans Village participants said there was a lot of drug use in the program compared with 50% of participants statewide. 90% of our veterans that participated felt that they had friends in the building that they could spend time with compared with 74% of participants statewide. 80% of our veterans felt supported by staff in accomplishing their goals compared with 66 of the of, of participants statewide. And 100% of veterans that lived in Shelton Veterans Village said they were very likely to ask staff for help when witnessing an opioid, opioid overdose, compared with 79% of participants statewide. Now, what that means is the veterans that are living in our in our village are refraining from drug use, uh, unlike many other ones around the, around the state. Uh, they feel supported, they feel secure, and they're rebuilding their lives. They're becoming taxpaying citizens. Uh, and they are becoming benefits in the community. Uh, I want everyone to see that this village has had a very direct and positive impact on our residents. And those positive benefits will transfer directly to reduce public displays, reduce first responder calls, reduce emergency room visits, and reduce taxpayer costs. Uh, and I'd also like to take, to take a moment while I have the forum uh, to mention that we conduct tours of our village to inform and educate those that are curious about the people we house and help reduce some of the rumors I've heard floating around town about our organization and our residents. Uh, as always, thank you for your service and your support to the community that you serve. That's all. Thank you, Dave. That's all. That is all. All right. Okay. Next on the agenda is a presentation from Finance Director Mike Gibbons. Thank you, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, and members of Council. I am going to present the August financial report. We skipped a month uh, last month, but we're going to be heavy into budget for the next few meetings. So let me start with where we're at here on the about 67% of the fiscal year through August. Um, we're in the final stages of prepping the 2025 budget that will go out to you in packet um, in about another week and a half. We'll have a public hearing on November 5th to look at the full budget. 
I'm going to focus a bit here on the general fund in the beginning. Um, we use a good amount of what's in this report to estimate where the funds are going to be at year end so that we know where that starting place is going to be, not just in the general fund, but all of the other funds, the enterprise funds, to know what our capacity is within those budgets. I want to draw your attention to the August numbers. On, on this page, you'll notice that the revenues are estimated to exceed um, where we had it budgeted. So I'm looking at this line up here, where at 16, just over 16 million, 58,000, we had uh, budgeted 15.4 million. So again, it's about 600,000 over. Some of that um, is just simply due to revenue we didn't anticipate. Uh, we have a contract for the um, designated crisis responder that um, wasn't budgeted because at the time the budget was presented, we didn't know we'd have that. That was some unanticipated revenue. It's really in and out. It's revenue in and then we're spending it on the expense side of things. Um, we had some revenue from a Department of Justice bulletproof grant, um, bulletproof best grant that we received um, and some other and unanticipated grant revenue. So that's largely why that area um, is over budget. Um, another area that we're projecting will be over budget is in miscellaneous revenue. A lot of that is due to the opioid settlement um, money that we've received this year. And then um, I guess in a positive light, our investment interest um, due to the local government investment pool, um, bringing back really unprecedented returns again, um, at least before the Fed lowered the rate a bit, which will affect it slightly, um, our investment interest is well over where we budgeted. So that's largely why the revenue is exceeding. Um, it's certainly not a bad thing, but that's um, just to explain to you and the public why we're over budget on that amount. Um, our goal is to match ongoing expenses with ongoing revenue as much as possible, and then clearly explain where one-time expenses are attributed to one-time revenue. So those grants, um, I bring this up because we'll talk about it quite a bit in the budget process as we're making some recommendations to use one-time revenues. But in this case, that's what happened there. We have some one-time monies coming in. Um, some of these things we're also um, going to be reconciling in the year-end um, uh, budget update for 2024. We have some unanticipated revenues, in particular some grants in the enterprise funds where we need to do that supplemental budget for 2024 to reconcile some of that. Others, we're not going to really worry with because it's revenue in and revenue out. Um, nobody penalizes us for going over budget on revenue. It's really on expenses. We have to make sure we don't go over that amount you've authorized for us. And we won't, if you'll notice on the expense line, um, we're estimating expenses at just over 15.3 million and our budget authorization is um, 15.5 million. So that side of things is looking good. And again, this is where we're estimating it in August. Some things can change. Um, I don't anticipate expenses to go up much, um, but they certainly could change over the course of the last quarter of the year. Um, on, let me scroll down to um, page five, where we show that month to month comparison of the general fund, who got worried? Okay, there it comes in. This is a good page really to look at, I think on revenues, and I've pointed this out before, um, so that you can see where were we in August of 2023, so one year ago. And if you take a look at things, it really comes down to um, most of our revenue sources match pretty darn closely. Um, I think this goes to the point that our general fund revenue sources just don't change a lot. The one line you'll notice that is a fairly significant increase 
is that business and occupation tax because that rate was increased. So that comparison from August 24 to August 23 shows just over $357,000 increase. Um, and if you remember throughout this year, I've mentioned we'll probably be under budget on the B&O tax. We're now estimating, and you'll notice on here, that we'll probably reach full budget on that. So as we get better numbers, we're really able to predict a little bit more. And then you see some of those other lines where I was um, mentioning where we're estimating towards the bottom of the revenue section, miscellaneous revenue, it's up quite a bit. About $100,000 of that, quite honestly, is the investment interest that we've gotten better returns on than we anticipated. So that's really a good page to look at. You'll notice property tax, it just does not vary much from year to year. Sales and use tax really hangs in there about the same. So most of our revenue lines are pretty consistent with some slight increases where there are um, natural kind of adjustments. On the expense side, you can look down and see where we're anticipating different departments to be slightly over or under budget. Um, these are, of course, a little bit difficult sometimes to predict because again, we're estimating this as of August. We don't always know necessarily what's going to happen, but assuming all things stay equal, that's where we're at. And it's looking, I think, pretty good. Um, we're expanding the budget but not at a rate that would bring about concern from our perspective. So that's a good kind of comparison and match for the general fund month over month and year, year to year. I'm gonna go down to page seven where we have the fund balances. This is what directors and um, in particular us in finance are using as we estimate fund balances. This is back as of August. For budget purposes, we're running it really um, as of today to try to make sure that where we're going to end up with these funds. In other words, what projects did we maybe not get to that we thought we were that were budgeted? So we have an accurate picture of that ending fund balance going into 2025 so that we're able to plan the projects that are necessary to execute the functions of the city across all of our funds. So. The general fund leads off at the top, but then followed by all of the rest of our funds. I pointed this out before too, on that estimated fund balance column, we wanna see things in the positive. Everything should be ending the fiscal year positive, not negative, and everything is. Um, there's a lot going on. You'll notice some of the um, funds are drawn down due to a lot of the projects that are happening. So that's a good thing to see. At the bottom of the page, are the FTEs. When we track this, um, we're a slight, well, there was one position filled in police. So there were 4.5 vacancies in the general fund at the end of July. And um, it's down to 3.5 because an officer was um, hired. So that's a great thing to see. Um, so the overall went from seven and a half to six and a half. And then the rest of the financial report um, shows our just citywide fund to fund comparisons. But I'll end there and I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Mike? Thank you. Questions for Mark? Thank you, Mike. Thank you. All right, next only business item we have is an LTAC recommendations by the city manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Deputy Mayor and Council. Uh, tonight, bringing to you recommendations from the Lodging Tax Advisory Committee. Uh, the city called for applications for what's referred to as LTAC, LTAC funds. Uh, back in September, uh, the LTAC committee met um, to review the applications and provide the recommendations to Council. Um, per RCW, the Council can consider uh, the applications or the actual funding allocations from the committee um, as a whole or partial, but cannot um, change each allocation or individual allocations. Um, you'll see on the first page, uh, there was about $97,000 granted last year. The actual 
it would be about $81,000 as there was two projects that were not completed and withdrew their projects. Uh, this year, there were 12 total projects submitted, 11 recommended for funding uh, for a total of $97,000. Uh, so this uses um, reserves uh, to fund these, uh, fund these projects in 2025. That's it. Come with your questions to see Right. Do we have a motion? Do we have a motion to forward the Long Committee recommendations and action agenda on November 5, 2024, for further consideration? All right. Any more comments or questions? Second. I'm sorry. Any more comments or questions? We have a motion and a second to place the Lodging Tax Advisory Committee recommendations on the action agenda for November 5th, 2024. Council meeting. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. First item on the action agenda is an update about the AMI project. Capital Project Manager Aaron Nix has details. Thank Good evening, you, Aaron. Uh, Council, appreciate your time. Uh, I apologize if I sounded off. I'm a little bit under the weather, but I'm doing the best that I can. I know that this is not a popular project uh, for some folks, um, namely because of the expense, um, and I get that. Um, I want the council to be aware that all utilities are going through this exact same thing because the reality is that all the utilities use mechanical meters in the past um, and have moved forward uh, with uh, replacing those uh, with these, these digital smart meters. Um, as I mentioned at our last meeting on September 18th, we, we had the bid opening for this project. The bids ranged from $948,000 to $2.79 million. Um, we received a total of nine. Um, the low bid uh, was with Keystone Utility Systems for $947,571.57. Um, again, Keystone Utility Systems they are an out-of-state vendor, uh, a contractor, but they have done jobs in the city of Bellevue and the city of Bridgeland, of which we made contact with them as we, we did our due diligence here. Um, so they, they are absolutely the low bidder. Um, for the council's reference, I know there was, uh, at least I've heard, um, I kind of want to just give you a little bit of background. The reality is that the city, and not me, uh, but previous staff have been working on this project for four plus years. Um, with COVID and what happened with that, chips, um, it was delayed for some time. Um, as I mentioned, our public works department started evaluating this uh, four plus years ago. We looked at all different types of water meters and um, chose the census I pearl meter for a couple reasons. Um, a question that I think people want to know about um, is the city aware of any past issues with the census I pearl meters, meaning in industry, have there been issues? Um, according to census, they resolved an issue causing their meters to malfunction in 2016 and 2017, and their meter failure rate since 2017 is nearly zero. Um, this statement is supported by uh, sample testing of uh, new meters being installed, uh, a lot of jurisdictions did that um, to verify the results and it came out good. Um, so I just wanted to paint a little bit about that. With regard to the, the issue in 2016 and 17, there was an appropriate seal and water got into the system. They corrected that. Um, and um, just so folks know, their product is guaranteed for 20 years of use. So I just wanna make folks aware of that. There's also been some questions and I didn't hear that this from anybody specifically with regard, with regard to these water meters, uh, the metering system, and the potential or viability um, to hacking and other interference in the modern water metering, metering process. Um, I will say that Census is an industry leader in this area, um, and they were we chose them because they were durable, their ease of use, and the protections that they actually have in place in their system. Um, as I indicated to the council at our last meeting, this decision wasn't taken lightly and we discussed uh, this at length when uh, selecting the actual system we went into. I was actually, actually able to reach out to census and I asked them the questions uh, about security and the ability to hack into the new meter and system. Here's what the response was. And I'm gonna read it verbatim because it's not my word. So um, the radio technology census uses in, in the FlexNet 
system operates in a licensed radio frequency, which is dedicated to the utility. So you get that as part of purchasing that. It's a dedicated private uh, frequency that you utilize. Um, this provides significant legal protections because anyone without a license cannot legally transmit in this radio frequency <clears throat> and um, attempt to send their own data. And it goes both ways. Some of the other things that I learned is the data that they do transmit. It's typically, you can adjust the frequencies and the times that do that. Usually it's six times a day um, that that's shooting out that information. It's encrypted, meaning that people can't take it and steal it and start using it and change it and manipulate it. Um, <clears throat> the various components of the system are segmented into separate security domains. This provides a layered approach to security in which security methods and processes are implemented through a combination of proprietary and third-party security controls, ensuring confidentiality, talk about encryption, that's, that's included integrity, authenticate, authentication, and the availability, um, and that has to pertain to redundancy and resiliency of the system. These are really good systems and are hard to hack. So um, I just want to kind of bring that to council's attention. Um, see, another thing I just want to just briefly touch on, a significant FlexNet component, again, FlexNet mm -hmm. is part of the census system, um, is a network regional interface, an RNI, and I, Bear with me, I'm not an expert in this either, uh, and I'll, I'll help try to explain it, which incorporates a dedicated industry standard high security module in AS, HSM to provide key storage. H, HSMs provide both logical and physical protection of high value cryptographic key materials from non-authorized users and potential adversaries. The data is protected, it's encrypted, they can't get it. So there has been not, and I well, I did search on Google, has there been any history of this that has occurred? And I have not seen that with the census type um, system. So just wanted to make that you guys aware of that. Obviously open to additional questions, but with this, we're asking for the council to award HubWorks contracts to Keystone Utility Systems in the amount not to exceed $947,571.57. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Daniel, anyone set up public comment? No, Mr. Mayor. We have a reading of resolution number 1340-0624. Resolution 1340-0624, a resolution of the Council of the City of Shelton, Washington, authorizing the city manager to approve a public works contract with Keystone Utility Systems in order to construct the city water meter replacement project. Thank you. We have a motion. Mr. Mayor, move to adopt resolution number 1340-0624 as presented. Second. All right, comments or questions? I just wanted to say thank you for thinking about the extra steps that might happen in case we are hacked because there was an incident recently here at the city council meeting. And thank you for thinking about things that you might not have thought about, the extra measures that we go to to take care of our water and our building. And I, I really been here for, you know, since the past three years, we've been wanting to upgrade and make sure that we take our people out of the field and get them back doing stuff in the office and other things instead of going out and metering or moving inside of an way. So we've scaled the efficiency and we're force multiplying by doing this. So um, thank you all for choosing a good system that has backups and security. And I'm very comfortable with sending this forward and making sure that we have secure water systems in the future. Thank you. Anybody else? This, I have no questions. This is years in the making. We've been working on this for, what, maybe four years now. So I'm, I'm glad it's coming to fruition. So we have a motion and a second to approve resolution number 1340-0624 presented. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Okay. Motion carries. Our last item is a resolution for ILA with Mason County Superintendent Brent Armstrong for detail. Evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, Council, uh, bringing forward an interlocal agreement with Mason County for reimbursable work supplies and services. So, this is um, an updating of uh, past ILA that we've had with Mason County. Uh, gives us the ability to share equipment with Mason County on items that we may not have. Um, they have 
bigger pieces of equipment for rollers and um, utilizing uh, more dump trucks if needed. Um, yeah, the equipment in that nature. Um, we are able to do small projects with this, um, not lasting more than a day. So it's usually just a smaller end project for the bigger projects that would take a separate agreement. Um, over the day project. We also are able to use their fueling uh, station at the county shop. So if something goes awry with ours, you can go up there. Um, gives us some redundancy in that. And then also shop services. So there's some specialized equipment that they have. You like it from them? Thank you, Brent. Does anyone have a public comment? No, Mr. Mayor. Never read of resolution number 1351-0924. Resolution number 1351-0924, a resolution of the Council of the City of Shelton, Washington, authorizing the city manager to sign an interlocal agreement with Mason County for the exchange of equipment and small public works services. Thank you, Danielle. Do we have a motion? Mr. Mayor, to approve resolution number 1351 0924 Second. Right, comments or questions? Just, uh, just wanted to talk about how I like how we're setting the precedent for cooperation with the, with the county and uh, how we're complementing each other with our strengths and that we are um, relying on economies of scale to help ourselves be more efficient in government. And that I would like to continue with a lot of these um, very low agreements, and that we have a big relationship with the county and all the different agencies that are out there, especially during the season when we're going to have a lot of weather events and things that are going on, that we are efficient in our means to get to um, emergency as possible. So, thank you very much for working with the county and making this process easy and smooth. All right. Any more comments and questions? Again, I am, uh, it's always nice to work with our county partners. Um, Right, we have a motion and a second to, to waive the three touch rule to approve resolution number 1351 0924 is presented. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Mark, do you have a report tonight? You know, just one thing I wanted to mention tonight was from the council. Um, the leaves are falling. You can see them drug inside, out, inside the building here. Um, and as I drove down the street the other day, I, I saw somebody blowing their leaves out into the street. Um, it might seem innocuous, but during this time of year, those compounded leaves can plug up drains, lead to flooding and things like that. I, I just want to bring that to I think the council's attention, the public's attention that um, if we can, you know, we can refrain from that, um, it'll help alleviate some of the concerns, some of the problems and flooding that we have, um, help us out when it becomes uh, quite rainy, which we'll see it here before long, clear out a drain, don't blow the, the, the leaves out in the street, maybe help us out with uh, some of the damage that occur on a regular basis or on an annual basis at times around, particularly some of our, our problem location. Uh, the crews will get out on the streets and sweep them as fast as they can, um, but it doesn't happen on a daily basis. So as much of that debris we can keep out of our rights of ways and into our storm drains, the better and help each other out. If you have neighbors that they really like some ground cover for the winter, let them know. Yeah, they'll come and pick them up. So um, that's my suggestion. All right. Is that it for your report? That's it. No All right. Anybody you. have any questions for, for Mark? No? Does the council have any new items for discussion? All right. Our next meeting is Tuesday, November 5th, 2024 at 6 p.m. We also have a study session October 27th at 6 p.m. This meeting is adjourned at 6.44 p.m. <laughs>